Hello everyone, welcome back to the Crime Scene Photography video lecture series put on by ECP Online. This week we're going to talk about speed and light, two very important variables when it comes to photography. Um, we're going to talk about adjusting two new exposure controls, shutter speed and the ISO setting. Last week, we discussed the first exposure control, which was aperture selection, and we also talked about how the f-stop numbers designate whether or not an aperture is big or whether it's small. Remember uh, Tupac and the uh, 22 caliber bullet, right? All right? We examined how selecting large or small apertures can change the amount of light that enters your camera. And this week, we're going to look at the sec second exposure control, which is shutter speed. Shutter speed is the time that the shutter is allowed to remain open. And by shutter, what I mean by that is if you look at your camera, sometimes it's kind of hard to see, but if you look through the lens towards the body of the camera, um, you might see what look like petals or a slide. Um, what the shutter is, is it's like a curtain. It's a curtain that keeps the light that's coming through the lens from entering the camera and that curtain has a hole in it usually, right? Um, the aperture, so the aperture can be made smaller or bigger, but if the shutter is closed, it's not allowing any of that light that comes in through the lens to actually reach the film plane or the digital sensor, depending on what kind of camera you're using, okay? So the shutter stops light from coming into the camera. And the speed of which it does that is usually expressed in fractions of a second. Um, and most cameras actually allow you to use full seconds as well. And we're going to talk about that more in the next few slides. Last week we learned that selecting a smaller or a bigger aperture changes the amount of light that comes into your camera. Well, selecting your type of shutter speed does the same thing longer or shorter shutter speeds, depending on which one you choose, it's going to either let less light into your image or more light, okay? Your shutter speed exposure has a continuum, just like your aperture selection, okay? And shutter speeds are written in whole numbers, like you see above, um, unless they have a little quotation next to the number. So you see the one on the left-hand side of the screen there that has little quotes next to it, if the little quotes are there, that means it's a full second. So if you see one with little quotes next to it, that's one second. If you see ten with little quotes next to it, that's ten full seconds. All the way up on to thirty seconds. A lot of uh, DSLR cameras, the ones that are usually used by crime scene photographers, have the option to have um, 30 full seconds set as the shutter speed, which is an eternity in terms of photography. There's also a setting on those types of cameras called bulb, um, which means that you physically flip a switch or push onto a little um, air bulb, which we don't use that much anymore, but uh, usually it's a, a shutter release cable and you can hold the aperture open for as long as you like. You can hold it open for full minutes, hours on end. Um, that's how you can make some really interesting photographs um, called star tracks. But anyway, um, the little quotations mean full seconds. The rest of the numbers on this continuum, 2, 4, 8, 15, 30, those are all fractions of a second. So the 2 actually means one half of a second, one over two. Eight actually means one eighth of a second, one over eight, okay? So if you see a number without the little quotations next to it, just remember that that's actually a fraction of a second. And you also notice two other images on this slide, right? The suns. Now, the sun on the right-hand side is relatively small, right? That's there to remind you that the shutter speeds on the right-hand side let in less light. And the larger sun on the left-hand side of the screen indicates that those are slower shutter speeds and they let in more light. Okay, let's talk about this concept a little bit more. If fractions aren't your thing, <laughs> don't worry, uh, for a lot of people they aren't, um, 
you can think of Schroedersby continuums the same way that you think about apertures, okay? The suns are either on the left-hand side or the right-hand side, and the numbers on the left side of the continuum are longer, slower shutter speeds. They let in more light. The numbers on the right side of the continuum are faster, okay, or shorter shutter speeds, and they let in less light. So here we've got our little guys <laughs> at the bottom of the screen, right? The very slow turtle is moving to the left side of the screen because that indicates that those shutter speeds are slow or longer. And the fast little cheetah that's dipping around down there is moving to the right because those shutter speeds are faster, okay, shorter. So remember our example from last week? We had a photographer, and the photographer decided to take a photograph using a specific aperture, right? Well, in this example, we're going to choose a specific shutter speed, okay? 60, or 1 60th of a second. That's actually a pretty typical uh, shutter speed to use, and we'll discuss why later on. But let's just choose 60 to start with, okay? And there's our picture of the puppy again, right? We get a proper exposure, but let's say we wanted more light. We don't want to change our aperture, though. We want to keep our aperture, okay? We want to keep the whatever aperture we decided to use, uh, let's say because we like the depth of field. In this image, the depth of field is actually pretty shallow, so maybe we're using an f4 or something like that. These exposure controls, guys, shutter speed, aperture, they all move independently of each other, and that gives you a lot of control over your image. So for this example, don't worry about your apertures, okay? We're just going to talk about shutter speeds. So we start at 60, or 1 60th of a second. Now, let's say we want the image to be brighter, okay? We would move to the left on the shutter speed continuum, right, because we want more light in the image, we're using a longer shutter speed. And the resulting image is brighter. How much brighter, you ask? Well, it's one stop, just like with the apertures, okay? Changing from a 60 shutter speed to a 30 shutter speed will double the light that comes into your image. And you'll remember from last week, that's plus one stop of light. So the image is twice as bright. Now if we go back, starting at 160 again, and this time we decide, yeah, it's a good picture, but maybe we want it darker, right? Now we're going to move to the right side of the continuum to 125th, 1 125th of a second, okay? Faster. Now our image is darker. How much darker, you ask? Well, it's one full stop, right? We've cut the light in that image by a half. So whether you're talking about the f-stop continuum, the shutter speed continuum, all of these numbers have a mathematical reason for why um, they are one full stop or one uh, one full stop brighter, one full stop darker, okay? I'm not asking you guys to know that. Um, the easiest thing to do would really be to memorize the continuums, but for this class, you're going to have them in front of you all the time, okay? So just know that if you move one number to the left or one number to the right, you're going to be changing by one full stop, okay? You're either going to be halving the amount of light or doubling the amount of light, okay? Okay, if this doesn't quite make sense to you yet, um, you can also think about shutter speeds using the water analogy we talked about last week. Imagine a water faucet that's turned on for a very short period of time. Okay, short period of time, just a little bit of water ends up in the bottom of the glass, right? Think of that as your picture. Just a very small amount of light ends up in your picture. Now, if you leave the water on for a longer period of time, more water is going to fill up the glass, right? There you go. With photography, 
the longer you leave the shutter open, the more light will enter your image. Okay, so that's just another way to think about uh, time as it relates to light in your photographs. Okay. So let's go back, let's review the three basic elements of all photographs and see where shutter speed fits into this equation. The amount of light in the picture, now we just talked about that, right? We talked about how if you leave your shutter open for longer periods of time, you're going to get more light. Last week we talked about focus. We talked about how selecting different apertures actually can change the depth of field in your image, okay? And the last element was motion, right? And we haven't found an exposure control that really handles motion yet. But guess what? That's shutter speed. That's exactly what shutter speed does. So let's look at that. Aperture selection and f-stops affect the amount of light. That's true, okay, in your image as well as depth of field, like we just talked about. Shutter speed affects the amount of light in your image and how the image captures motion. So if you use a slow shutter speed, any object in your photograph that's moving is going to appear blurry or streaked. Okay, in this image below of the dancers that are twirling around, that picture isn't out of focus. It's not fuzzy because the focus is off. It's blurry because there's motion and the objects that are moving through that scene are not being frozen by a really fast shutter speed. Okay, so this image below was taken using a slow shutter speed. And the opposite is true if you use a fast shutter speed. If you use a fast shutter speed, any object that's moving in your image will appear frozen in space, just like these dancers. Okay, so these dancers are all jumping, they're in motion, but you don't see any of the motion blur that we saw in the first image because this photographer is using a fast shutter speed. It's also possible that they could be using a flash, which also freezes motion. But you don't need a flash to freeze motion. If you use a fast enough shutter speed, all the motion in your image is going to be frozen, just like it is in the picture below. So here's some general guidelines for how fast a shutter speed needs to be to freeze certain objects that are in motion. Okay? Turns out a shutter speed of 125 or 1 1 25th of a second will freeze a person that's walking. A shutter speed of 500 or 1 500th of a second will freeze a bicyclist or a slow moving vehicle, usually around 30 miles an hour or anything slower than that. A shutter speed or an SS, an abbreviation, of 1000 will freeze a car moving 60 miles an hour and an SS of 2000 will freeze a propeller airplane. Okay, so as you can see, if objects are moving slower, you can get away with using a slower shutter speed, right? But as they move faster, you need that shutter to move very, very quickly to be able to freeze that motion, okay? Now here's another subject matter that's really important for you guys as photographers because I see this all the time from my students. The subject of your photograph isn't the only thing that's affected by shutter speed. If your shutter speed is too slow, just the beating of your heart can cause your hand to shake and that can cause motion blur. And that's the uh, effect that you're seeing right here in this picture of the squirrel, okay? The squirrel's not moving. Um, the camera is. Notice how everything is kind of blurred um, and it appears like maybe it's out of focus, but this is actual motion blur. What's happening is the photographer didn't use a fast enough shutter speed and they didn't use flash. And so trying to hand hold the camera actually caused this motion blur. Um, a lot of people say, oh, my hands are too shaky, so I can't take photographs. Well, that's, <laughs> that's just because you're not using a fast enough shutter speed, okay? Everybody's hands are shaky. Even if you think you have the most steady hands in the world, you don't because you're moving. Even if you don't realize it, just the beat of your heart is actually enough to cause a blur in the camera if you're not using a fast enough shutter speed.
So for most handheld cameras, if you aren't using a flash, you need at least a 60 or a 1 60th of a second shutter speed to freeze the shake of hand holding a camera. Okay, so as you guys are playing around with your digital cameras, even if you're using them on auto, I want you guys to pay attention. If your flash doesn't fire and you get an image like this below, I want you to know, oh, okay, that's because the shutter speed that was either selected by you or selected by the camera was too slow to freeze the motion of your hands. Okay, so good thing to keep in mind because you're probably going to see this as you start playing around with your cameras. So far, we've discussed the apertures and the shutter speed, and those two exposure controls have an effect on the light in your image. There is one more exposure control that can affect how light is captured in your image, and that is the ISO setting. Back when film was used for crime scene photography, and it still is, in some jurisdictions it still is, um, you had to select the type of film you wanted to use based on its ISO rating. And here's the definition I'd like you guys to know. ISO film speed setting, okay? The ISO stands for International Standards Organization. And that abbreviation is used for a whole bunch of things, but we use it in film too. So if you're talking about the ISO setting for film, it designates how sensitive to light that particular film is. And I know what you're saying. You're saying, well, we don't use film anymore, Rachel. <laughs> we use digital. Well, that might be true. But today, um, our digital cameras also allow us to adjust an ISO setting in them. And the reason for that is because, you know, photography has been around for quite some time, and photographers get used to talking about um, exposure control settings um, in the way that they have for you know, just about hundreds of years. So we kept it the same when we switched to digital. And we're going to talk about how changing that setting will affect the light in your image. And ISO settings also have, you guessed it, another continuum. Okay, and this one's pretty easy to remember because the numbers are just doubled as you continue along. Okay, from 50 to 100, 100 to 200, 200 to 400, it, it's just a double. So there's no strange numbers in between like the shutter speeds and the f stops have that don't fit with uh, that equation. Okay, now choosing a lower number ISO will make your camera insensitive to light. That's the way I want you guys to think about it. Technically, there's a mathematical equation that's going on in the digital processing of your camera, but don't think about it like that. Just think about it in terms of sensitive or not sensitive to light. Okay, so if you're using an ISO of 50, you usually want to use a setting like that when there's a lot of light in the scene, right? It's a bright sunny day out, it's in the middle of the afternoon, and there's a lot of light in the scene. So your camera can be relatively insensitive to light. There's so much of it there that we don't need to capture all of it because there's plenty of it there. So uh, usually, and in your book, you'll read about the F16 sunny day rule. Okay, and the F16 sunny day rule, if it's bright and sunny out, you can use an F16 with an ISO of 100, and that's probably gonna give you an appropriate exposure. Okay, it'll be the proper exposure. So sunny days or when there's a lot of light in an area, you can get away with the numbers on the left hand side of the continuum, 50, 100, 200, all right? Now if you choose a higher number ISO, that's going to make your camera more sensitive to light. And we use these settings when there isn't a lot of light in the scene and we need to capture as much of it as possible. So a good um, example of this is nighttime photography. Usually in my nighttime scenes, if I'm not using flash or big external light sources to add more light to the scene, I'm usually using a ISO of 800, 1600, and they can go up you know, pretty high. Um, in this class, we're not really going to talk about graininess because we're not doing a whole lot on um, film history. But you need to be careful if your images 
um, if you take images at really high ISOs, you can get a graininess to your picture. And in digital photography, uh, that can be uh, dark noise. And there's more in your textbook about that. But for right now, what I, got, I would like you guys to remember is that the numbers on the left-hand side, the low ISO settings, make your camera insensitive to light. And the numbers on the right make it more sensitive. Okay. What about the stops, you say, <laughs> right? Um, which one is plus one stop? Which one is minus one stop? Well, it's the same as the aperture continuum and as the shutter speed continuum. So the image um, in the center, let's say we started at an ISO of 200, OK? And that's the image it gave us. With whatever shutter speeds and apertures we decided to select, we're using an ISO of 200 here. Now, if we leave all of the other exposure controls the same, and we change the ISO to 400, what have we done? We've doubled the light coming in, and we've changed it by plus one stop. And the opposite's true if we go the other way on the continuum, right? If you divide 200 by a half, you get ISO of 100. And if you move to 100, everything else being left the same, you've halved the light coming in to your image, and you've changed it by minus one stop of light, okay? So ISO is probably the easiest one to remember of the three continuums. So hopefully you guys have not thrown your computers out of the window yet, <laughs> or you haven't smashed them <laughs> with some kind of hammer, okay? If you're feeling overwhelmed and it feels like there's a lot of new information that was just thrown at you over the past few weeks, that's because it was, okay? This is a lot of new information. And it's completely natural for students to feel overwhelmed when learning this much new material. But I'd like for you guys to think about this like you're learning a new language, okay? There's a lot of new terminology to use. And if you've ever studied a new language, you know you didn't master it right away. You didn't sit down for two weeks and become fluent in French or Spanish or something like that, okay? But as you start using the terminology and practicing the concepts we're discussing, you're going to get more and more comfortable with these concepts. I promise, okay? So take a deep breath and just kind of let the information marinate in your head a little bit, okay? I promise it's going to get easier. So let's do some practice right now, okay? Let's pull it all together and let's take a look at a few photographs and see if we can tell what's going on in each, you know, what exposure controls are being used. So the first thing that I think of when I look at this picture is motion, okay? The shark is jumping out of the water and eating some poor defenseless penguin or seal or something like that, right? Okay, so what's going on with the motion? Is it blurry? Not really, no. I mean, you can see that the shark is basically frozen in the air up there, right? And so is the water coming off of its poor little prey, right? So. I'm guessing that in this, there is a fast shutter speed going on. Now, how about depth of field? What's going on with the depth of field? Is everything in focus? Not really, no. In the background, we see that the, um, the hills or the mountains, whatever's back there in the clouds, those are out of focus. And even in the center of the image, the water just behind the shark is also out of focus. So we've got a narrow depth of field going on. Right? You've got a shallow depth of field, which means that we probably used a wider aperture, something like maybe a f2 or a f4, okay, or 2.8. And we've got a relatively fast shutter speed, probably something around you know, 125, 125th of a second, okay? How about this image? We've got some similar characteristics, right? Now, the horse is obviously in motion, and so is its tail, and probably the lasso that the cowboy is swinging around up there, right? So we've probably got a fast shutter speed going on because we don't see any motion blur, and because everything's not in focus, basically just the horse and the rider, everything in the background and foreground are out of focus, we've got the same situation. We've got a shallow depth of field, created by a wider aperture or a larger aperture and we've got a fast shutter speed to freeze the motion. Now about this one, 
This is a little different, right? Let's talk about focus first of all. What's going on with focus? Well, it might be hard to tell because of the blur that's going on with the uh, water from the fountain, but everything is relatively in sharp focus. Look at the building all the way in the background. It's in focus. The fountain itself is in focus. Most of the water ripples actually in the foreground are also in focus. But what's going on with the shutter speed? Is everything frozen? Can you see all the little droplets of water? No, you've got a lot of motion blur going on there. This is a trick that photographers use when they photograph fountains or waterfalls all the time. Okay, So you've got a wide depth of field, which was created by using a small aperture, like f16 or f22. And you've got a slow shutter speed going on because you can see some of the motion blur. Right Now, if we haven't talked about ISO settings here, because usually the most important elements to photographers are what's in focus and making sure that there's no motion blur or adding motion blur if artistically that's what you want to do. But obviously in crime scene photography we're not interested in that. We want everything to be in crisp clear focus and we don't want anything to be obliterated by blur, right? So usually when photographers are dealing with exposure controls they set their apertures and they shut, set their shutter speeds and then they use their ISO to compensate one way or the other. Okay, So in this situation it was taken at night so I'm guessing it was probably about an ISO of 800 maybe 1600. Why? Because there's not a whole lot of light going on there. There's light coming off of the fountain but not like what you would see you know mid sunny day rule, right? Not at uh, noon and the sun's directly overhead and there's no clouds, okay? Obviously there's way less light in this image um, than that situation. So that's why I would say the photographer most likely used a uh, higher ISO setting making the camera more sensitive to light. Now how about this one? This one is a little tricky. It's not so tricky when it comes to the depth of field, right? I mean, we can't even see the background at all that this photograph was taken on. So it is completely out of focus and it's definitely got a shallow depth of field, right? So we know that they used a big aperture, um, probably something like, uh, actually this would probably an F2, even maybe uh, a 1.4. But the motion is a little bit difficult, right? Because the center of the owl is obviously moving one way or the other. It's moving because it's in flight. But the, the shutter speed is a little bit tricky. It's tricky because it was fast enough to freeze the body of the owl, but if you look at the feathers, there's motion blur going on there. So what does that tell us? That tells us that there's a couple different types of motion going on in this photograph. The body of the owl is moving at one speed and its feathers on the end of its wings are moving at, at a faster speed. So that's a pretty cool thing to know. You can know um, kind of specifics about the motion going on in a photograph just by being comfortable with your exposure controls. So here are your takeaway points for this week. First of all, give yourself some time okay, to absorb all this new information. And you want to practice using your new terminology in our discussion area, for sure. That's what the discussions are for. And don't worry so much about being right or wrong. Some of the best ways to learn is to get it wrong the first time. Okay, When I, uh, when I started learning photography, it was in grad school and I had never heard of an f-stop uh, before I was 23 <laughs> and in grad school uh, learning crime scene photography for the first time and it was pretty scary <laughs> especially because I was in grad school and I thought I was supposed to know everything by then um, but I didn't and I got a lot of things wrong all the time so in our discussion forums and um, in ECP online you have a great environment where you can pick everybody's brain and you can ask your instructors lots of questions and ask each other lots of questions so don't worry about getting it right the first time around okay um, practice practice makes perfect you guys have heard that before um, and test yourself test yourself as you see images throughout the day we see photographs 
a hundred bazillion times a day, right? They're on TV, they're in print, they're in magazines, they're online, they're everywhere. So you can test yourself by looking at photographs that you've maybe looked at before, um, but now you know something new about it. Now you can test yourself. Okay, what is the depth of field in this image? What kind of aperture did they use? What kind of shutter speed? So even before you actually try photographing for yourself, you can actually learn a lot about photography just by looking at the images around you. Alright guys, have fun. I'll see you in the classroom.